That should be fun. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ignatius Times 2021 on conference. Uh, my name is Aryan, and I'm one of the co directors of Princeton Ignite STEM. And I'm here with Nastasia, who's the other co director. We're both juniors, and we're super excited to have you along with the rest of our team, about 15 to 16 other members. I'm going to walk through these slides slightly quickly because we're on a rush because we have a session coming up at 10. 10. So I'm just going to jump to the next slide and we'll do a quick check in through the chat in a few slides to see if everyone's here and settled in. So just a brief note on what Ignite STEM is. Ignite STEM is a student-run Princeton club that's hosting events to use design thinking, maker spaces, and project-based learning to classrooms. We've been hosting conferences for the past five or six years uh, with the goal of empowering educators to transform, uh, transform classrooms into cutting edge technologies like maker spaces, project-based learning, design thinking. As of more recently, we've been pivoting away to expand our like expand our outreach from educators to also high school teachers and also doing virtual events. So a quick note on what the goal is for today. Uh, Many of you are already familiar with Ignite STEM, some of you are not. The goal for today or for any event that we have in general is to practice some of the tools and techniques that we want you to implement in classes uh, in your own classrooms. For today, that's going to be design thinking in particular. So we want you to practice some design thinking and introduce it in, in your own classrooms. The other goal that we have is we want you to meet other teachers and share your teaching experiences in 2020. We know it's been a really rough year for I think every teacher, and we want you to meet teachers, connect with them through networking, connect with them through your teams, connect with them through the festival of ideas, which Anastasia will talk about in a second. Uh, but not just connect with them over this event. Uh, we want you to form those LinkedIn connections, those email connections, and actually follow up with them, and make sure that you walk out of this event with a network of people who you feel like can relate to everything that you've been through this last year. Now, one quick note on what the unconference is. Uh, we sent out emails of about a week ago or so on the handbook of the conference that it talks briefly about the conference, but it was just a long page of text. So assuming people haven't read it, the basic premise that we have for today's event is that in the past, we do conferences in person. That would have been in New York if, we, if things were completely normal right now. But when we were doing a virtual event, we thought about, well, what would be the best virtual event to do that teachers actually want to go to or would be interested in? And we thought about flipping the conference style uh, to make it seem like it's not just one of those traditional virtual events where you're just sitting on a screen and not really doing anything. So the whole concept behind the unconference is to have you engage with us as much as possible instead of just being a one directional uh, status. So, Thinking about how do you actually flip a classroom, well, it seems like there's three different ways that we thought about. The first one is to make sure that all the talks are given by teachers. So that's where the ed talks come in, where teachers who were previously attendees are now going to be giving TED style talks to all of you on topics that they feel would be interesting for everyone to hear about. The second thing to notice is that we have speakers like Richard Rusek, Chad Spool, and then Glenn, who have previously like, teaching experience or working with teachers. Um, so they also have experience uh, being around teachers or giving talks that are teacher led. The second thing to note is that uh, we want you to practice with everyone else. So that's why we introduce a lunch and learn where you network with other people and you talk about your experiences. We also have a design thinking hour uh, where people are going to be working along with teams to practice design thinking. And the final thing to note is that we try to make it two directional, uh, this, this unconference that we have by doing Q&As everywhere that we can and also introducing this festival of ideas where you talk about what you're working on with your teams. So I'll now be passing it on to Nastasia to talk about what's coming up next and a quick logistical, some quick logistical notes. Everyone, um, yeah, so like Arian said, we wanted to highlight some of our events for the schedule today. Um, and feel free to take a screenshot of this, but it's also going to be in the attendee handbook and in the Hopin homepage. So whatever's easier for you. Um, so yeah, so up next we have Jared Spool's intro workshop, which will be followed by a design thinking demo where you'll break into your team groups to get to know each other um, and fill out a quick worksheet. Um, and then we're going to have some great ed talks by fellow educators, then lunch where you can either network or do an optional um, workshop. Um, and then we're going to have a keynote by Richard, Richard Brusick. And then finally, a design thinking hour where, you, where you'll once again break into groups to discuss the classroom of the future. 
Um, finally, we'll have a festival of ideas where you'll share the ideas you come up with, uh, with each other and kind of learn from each other's ideas. Um, and then we're gonna have the closing panel with some great panelists. Um, and again, feel free to take a screenshot of this and ask us any questions you have. Um, so now I guess we can talk about some quick logistics. Um, so members of our team will be on the help desk throughout the day if you have any questions or need any help logging in or finding your team, et cetera. Um, so to find that, you go to Expo, which is on the bottom left of your screen, and then click Help Desk to get help, and one of our members will always be on call. Um, and then also you can click on the calendar icon above, the check this, above to check the schedule um, to see what's coming up next and how to get there. Um, and then we're also going to share slides for our modules, which we'll link in the chat um, for the 1030 Design Thinking module. Um, and then, yeah, and just like some other stuff. So you can take some time to check out the chat tab on the right um, and monitor it for Q&A questions and stuff, because that's going to be where most of the communication happens during the event, since we can't be in person, sadly. Um, and then also there's the feedback form in the same tab. Um, and yeah, we just really hope that you try as much as you can. Um, network with teachers at lunch and learn, ask questions during our keynote, share your ideas during festival ideas, et cetera, because we really want this to be a very communicative, um, exciting event. I'm actually, I'm actually going to try to see, since we have one minute, I'm going to try to see how people feel, try to get some experience with the chat. So what I'll ask everyone to do is, if you're here right now and you see the stage, like the chat thing on the right, uh, just type in your, your um, what's been like your, the thing that you, the worst thing that you've dealt with in terms of teaching during the pandemic in 2020. So what's been the most difficult thing about teaching remotely? What's been the most difficult thing teaching um not being not being in in your classrooms in person if you if everyone can just add a, a few words on the stage i just to get comfortable with how we're going to try to do the two direction interaction i'll wait a few seconds and in the meantime i think uh just to reiterate what nastasia said on the left there's a bunch of tabs there's a reception which is where you entered in there's a stage which we're on right now there's sessions which you'll be going to in a second, and there's networking, and then Expo. Expo is the one that you want to go to if you have any questions and you want to like talk to Ignatius and members to figure out anything else. Networking sessions and stage you'll be circulating between, but stage is the main one that you'll be going to for any talk related things. And finally, one thing that Nastasi also said was on the tab on the right, there's a chat. There's also another thing called Q and A's. That if you click on the Q and A section, that should be a way to ask questions that we'll be using for Q and A's for any talk that happens. So in a minute, we're going to have a talk with Jared. That's the one that we'll be using for Q and A's. Uh, we we do we see some difficulties that people mentioned in the chat. Uh, some of the things that I'm seeing are keeping people engaged, connection with students, collaboration, lack of hands-on. Uh, that's all something that we've all like heard about when we've like interviewed teachers in the past as well. So I'm going to take on the next slide, and then Sasha can wrap off uh, the opening the opening note. Um, yeah. So basically, overall, just like thank you so much for coming today. We're really excited to have you, um, and we really hope you enjoy it. And again, let us know if you have any questions or any feedback. Um, and now, Gloria, if you want to come up and introduce Jared. Hi, Gloria. Should be joining us in a second. Hi, everyone. Awesome. So I'm super excited to be here introducing Jared Spool. Um, I had the pleasure of working with him for the past few um, weeks and months leading up to this conference, talking with him um, about sort of his work and also uh, his talk for, for this event. He's the co-founder of Center Center and is one of the most knowledgeable communicators on the subject of user experience UX today. He's the CEO of Center Center, like I mentioned, which is a user experience design school built from the ground up with the sole purpose of making UX designers that everybody wants to hire. We're really excited to hear Jared's insights about design thinking, building up the K-12 classroom, and envisioning change for the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jared. The stage is all yours. Oh, thank you so much. I am uh, so excited to be here. And... Uh, excited to be part of this program. Uh, the team has been working really hard to make this happen. And uh, if you are happy to be here, uh, but put something in the chat that says that, that you are thankful for all the efforts that this team has put together to, to make this event happen this week. Um, I am uh, a 
uh, as Gloria mentioned, I, I run a school called Center Center, and Center Center is is uh, uh, a place where adults who are shifting careers come to learn the field of of user experience design. User experience design is uh, uh, easily thought of as as uh, uh, user experience designers are all the people who are chartered in the world to fix all the things that make all the technology that you have really confusing and frustrating. So uh, uh, that's what we do. We teach folks to, um, uh, uh, to to understand how to do those things. And and what's interesting with of working with uh, people who are shifting careers is that we get people with a large number of backgrounds, people who come from all different places in the world. And, and uh, that, that sh uh, watching them change is, is absolutely fascinating. And, and it's that it's change that I want to talk about today. Uh, I thought that we could uh, have a little conversation about it. And if I, do this right. We'll even have time for for uh, a couple of questions in um, uh, in the at the end. So uh, if you uh, have a question uh, at some point, there's a, a little Q and A part uh, of this hop in thing. You can go and and ask a question there. Uh, it should be at the top of the chat. You should be able to see it there and and that will be able to help you. Um, so let's talk about this crazy last year, uh, what folks refer to as, as unprecedented times. Um, the, the, th this past year, um, we had to undergo a lot of change, right? Suddenly everything changed out from under us. I, I, and, you being classroom teachers probably know this more than anybody. I mean, it's just nothing was the way it was. And this type of change is something that, that people don't like. I mean, in general, nobody gets excited about uh, having change like this. Uh, uh, it, But it's not that people dislike change. We like change all the time. You know, most people like it when the seasons change, except for people who've settled in California because they don't seem to change there. But every place else, people seem to like it when the seasons change. Uh, people like to get new things. They like to move into new places. They they uh, like to go on vacation. So it's it's not that people don't like change. This is one of the 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 myths of of uh, particularly the design world that I work in, it's, it's, uh, there's always this grumbling, well, people don't like change. And so they get angry when you change things. But the issue there isn't that, that, that they don't like change. The issue is that they don't like change they're forced to do when they're not prepared, right? There's this whole, uh, um, psychology around change, which is more about control than about anything else, that we like to have control over the changes that we we undergo. And the problem with the last year is that uh, we, we were forced to change in so many different ways so quickly, and we had no control over this. And more importantly, we had no support for it right? Nobody knew what we should be doing. Nobody knew how this should work. We experimented on each other. We, most of those experimented experimentations we can look back and now say were really not effective the way we wanted. And we just had this large scale amount of change. And uh, we'd like to think of this last year as being an aberration, as being something that is highly unusual. And if you look through the, the lens of all the change that happened so quickly, it definitely was unusual. But if we zoom out and we look at all the years leading up to it, we can see that there was lots of change that was going on that most of which we couldn't control. It was just happening at a, at a slower pace. It was happening at 
uh, um, a different cadence. And we weren't prepared for any of those changes either. But we were doing our best to adapt. We were doing our best to, to either put blinders on and pretend the change wasn't happening or do small scale experiments, small scale things that would help us understand whether the change uh, was, was working. And, uh, but when we look at this last year, we, we often refer to it as a deviation from normal. Right, that 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 what we really want to do right now, more than anything, is return to normal. And that this idea of returning to normal is really about getting back into control, about getting back into uh, a a world where um, uh, we have some control over uh, the uh, experiences. Uh, that that we are living, that we have some control over the environment that we are in, uh, that we are able to to move through change at a pace that is far more confident, far more useful. And this is this is a lesson that I take from the design work that we do. We teach our students at Center Center that 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 if you you know if you're working on some software system uh, uh, and you suddenly release a new update, you want to give people the opportunity to control the change that they're about to go to. None of us like, uh, you know, to have, we have a system where we're coming in and we have to bring up our course plan and, and, and we knew how to do that yesterday, but overnight the usability fairies came in and they redesigned everything on our behalf. And we come in and now, instead of getting our course plan, we get a little prompt that says, hey, would you like to watch a video about our new release? And like, no, I need to go teach a class. I'm, I have to go work on my, my, my coursework. And uh, uh, we didn't get to control that change. And this is basically the unprecedented year that we had uh, 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 for the last year is that, that nothing worked. Nothing seemed to be normal. And, and we began to realize that there were so many weaknesses in our system, uh, so many things that weren't, uh, that, that, um, uh, weren't working for us. And so this idea of returning to normal, that's not going to happen, Right. What we need to do is we need to return to better. We need to get to a place where, where we are actually producing better things for the folks that we're working on, for the students, for the parents, for the schools, for the uh, uh, society. All of these things have to be improved over what we had, not back to what we had, because what we had was what got us into the last year to begin with. So that's... that. Uh, uh, is is really sort of the the key to to how we need to frame what we do. Whenever we undergo substantial change, we we undergo substantial change in in three forms, right? In one sense, we have to we have to change the tools that we use, right? The the both the physical tools of of whether we teach in a classroom or in a, over a computer, we need to we need to uh, uh, think about the the sort of metaphorical tools that we use of 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 how we communicate, how we uh, um, uh, frame the practices and processes that we use. Um, uh, so tools, our tool set has to change. Whenever we change, our tool set has to change, and because our tool set changes, we also have to change our skill set. Right, teaching in these new forms requires new skills. Being able to teach in a hybrid classroom requires skills that we've never had to have before. Being able to pay attention to what's happening in the live room and being able to pay attention to what's happening uh, uh, with students who are not in the room, we have to. Those are new skills we have to develop. Of course, then we have to come up with new tools to manage those skills. But the third piece that we have to work on is our mindset. We have to understand that that uh, uh, 
there are frame ways we frame the world, ways we frame what we do, ways we frame our practices, ways we frame our objectives that uh, maybe aren't the right ways to frame these things. And a lot of what has to happen in change is we have to ha go through a reframing. We have to think about this. And we, we are in an unprecedented moment in that we are about to undergo massive change again. As the, the society comes back to, to uh, uh, having people who can function without the threat of catching a deadly disease, as we uh, get to this moment where um, uh, the economy can open back up, as we can bring students back into physical schools and we can once again resume uh, 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 having social contact that isn't through a, a box in a computer uh, where you're sitting for the entire time. Uh, um, the, this, these types of changes uh, uh, are an opportunity. They're an opportunity for us to not go back to normal, but to go to something better, to actually be deliberate about our change, to understand what we want and be intentional about it. Now, one of the things we teach our students is, is that we need to focus more on outcomes than on outputs. It's very easy for us to focus on outputs. This is what, this is what adults do, right? We get into this mode where, where things are, are so complicated that, that it's just like, let's just get the output done, right? Let's just get dinner on the table. Let's just get uh, uh, our lesson plan created. Let's just get through this next course. Let's, let's just get the, out, the output uh, uh, to happen. And we lose sight in that focus on outputs, on the outcomes that we want to have. Outputs are the things that we deliver. They are, we can't make change in the world without delivering something. So outputs are, are critical to that success. But the, uh, uh, what we really need to do is understand outcomes. Outcomes are the change that happens when we deliver our outputs. And we get some say in what that change is. We get to, to, to be able to do the outputs in a way where the outcomes are what we want, that the outcomes are making the lives of people better, that they're making the lives of our students better, they're making the lives of the parents better, they're making the lives of society better. The, uh, uh, we can even, if we want to, make the lives of our administrators better, though. I'm not sure that, that they'd earn that. Uh, but the the the... The reality is, is, is that uh, uh, we need to focus on, on outcomes. And outcomes are much, much harder to achieve than outputs. Uh, uh, we, can, we can get dinner on the table, but is it a good dinner? Is it a healthy dinner? Is it, is it a dinner that everybody enjoys? That, that's, that's much more difficult. And, and we, when we lose sight of that, it becomes uh, a, 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 a complicated thing. I remember doing a, a research study a few years ago. We were working with a, a, a client who was in the health and wellness space. And we were going and we were interviewing people about the meals they cooked. And we were trying to understand where, what it was. And, and, we met this one woman who uh, told us right off that she hated cooking. She just hated cooking. She hated cooking dinner every night. It was just drudgery to her. And we talked to her a while about why she hated cooking and all the things. And she gave us a million reasons as to, as to what she didn't like about it. Uh, uh, that, that she tended to cook the same thing every night because her husband was a, was a meat and potato kind of guy. And he just wanted meat and potatoes. And his, her daughter would, would eat cereal for dinner. She just didn't care. So, so uh, uh, it, 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 she just didn't like cooking. And then we started talking to her about what she did for fun. And she immediately volunteered that the one of the most fun things she's been doing lately is she's been going out with her girlfriends and going to a, a class on Italian cuisine. 
and she was making all sorts of fun dishes and she was really enjoying this and wait 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 a second i thought you said you hate to cook and she says well that's not cooking i'm taking this class on on making you know all these great pastas and dishes and all these things and uh uh suddenly uh uh we're like well why don't you make those at home and she says because nobody will eat them nobody likes them right and she was the the outcome was not her focus it was about the output she was focused on just getting that meal on the table and she she didn't like her life in that space but when she could change the outcome suddenly it was it was something under her control and something that she could uh uh really find uh uh desirable and this is the heart of of the work that i do the work that i do is about design we teach people to become designers. And you can think of design as being the rendering of intent. Uh, uh, a designer has an intention for a change that they want to see in the world. And the rendering are the actions that they invest to get to that intention. And the thing is, is that while we have a school where we train people to earn the title of designer, the reality is, is that everybody who comes into our school already is a designer. They're already rendering intentions all the time. And sometimes those intentions get them outcomes they want, and sometimes they're just outputs. And what we end up doing in our school is we end up teaching people that, that not everyone is a good designer. That, that, that when you focus just on outputs, you often don't get the change you want to see because all you're doing is delivering you're all you're doing is production you're not actually seeing things but if we're going to make changes happen we need to focus on outcomes and that's where better designers come in better designers look at outcomes because outcomes are really about uh uh complex worlds we can divide the world into um uh, a, a model where there are simple problems that we know how to solve. My shoelaces come untied. I know how to fix that problem. I tie my shoes, right? That's a simple problem. We have complicated problems that are that that we know how to deal with, right? Getting dinner on the table, uh, 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 or even entertaining a guest, we know how to solve that problem. We get out some recipes. We follow the recipes. We're able to do that. We can call that a complicated problem. But then there are problems that are complex. And complex problems uh, are problems that, that involve uh, uh, multiple variables. variables. They're, about, they're about systems. They're about uh, uh, interactions. If I pull the lever here, something over there changes. And so I have to be aware of those sort of systemic changes. And the best designers are the designers that, that start to pay attention to the systems around them, start to pay attention to, to how, if I do this thing here, I get these effects. And we saw this in big time over the last year where we sent kids home. We said, well, we'll just teach them on, on Zoom, except what happens in a household where they have three kids in one computer? Right? What happens in a household where the parents have to work? What happens when you have a kid who can't sit in front of a screen for six hours a day? Right, And suddenly we have to understand how the systems work, how the interactions work. We have to understand all of these pieces. And that's what makes someone a better designer, is that we're always learning. We're in a continuous learning mode. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today, is that is that what you want to do what we want to be thinking about are is the framing right so when you're in your sessions today think in terms of not just the tool set and maybe not even just the skill set but what's the mindset changes that we have to undergo what's the new framing that we have to have and think of this as being a complex system one where there are dynamics that are always sort of moving things around right? You know, ponds want to return to a steady state. You throw a rock in a pond and the systems of the pond cause the, the water to create waves, but eventually the pond tries to return back to that steady state. But it's that change, that moment where the pebble is thrown into the pond that we want to understand best. 
because that's where we can can do our best work. This last year wasn't a lost year. It was a found year, right? We found out that we have a lot of work to do. We found out that we really don't understand the systems that we work in and that we need to understand them better. We found out that, that if we want control over the change, we have to have a different mindset. We have to learn to be better designers. And that's what I came to talk to you about today. Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. I'm hoping that I've left a minute for a question or two. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I have. <laughs> uh, Gloria, are you still with us? Or, or Rohit, hi, ah, okay, hi. Oh, there we are. Uh, 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 should we move on or should we take a question? Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Spool. And uh, we will be moving on. Um, and I think that, uh, but please feel free to send up. We'll pass them on. That was an incredible talk. So Annika, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, so my name is Annika. I'm one of the content team leads um, for Ignite STEM. And right now we'll be giving a presentation that's, um, that's the introduction to the, um, the design thinking module you'll be doing in this session. Hi, I'm Thajus. I'm one of the people on the content team, and I'll be helping lead the discussion. All right, so in just a few minutes, we are going to be jumping to your teams in the session tab. Now, just quick logistical note, if you have any problems, you're the only person in your team room, you don't have a team yet, just head to the help session in the expo tab, and we will help you find a team. But the goal, goal of this next session is to meet with your team, really bond as a group. We've connected you with some wonderful other teachers to really connect with, um, and we have suggested we go through this module that will just take the basics of design thinking we're going to use again later today. So uh, just over some of the aspects of what we're going to be doing over the next half hour. So first, spend some time getting to know each other. If that's all you get to, that's fine too, because it's really important to um, uh, make sure that we have uh, a good working relationship, which is really core to design thinking in teams. So here are some interesting prompts. Like, for example, Annika, what is the most exciting thing you've ever done? Is this on conference? That, that is exciting. Tejas, if you could have dinner with two historical figures, who would you pick and why? I'd have to pick Gandhi. Einstein, and I think they make really good dinner, des dinner guests. All right, and so once we've finished with that, we've bonded as a group, we are going to be dealing with a very special prompt um, today. What are some of the things you find most frustrating about the grocery store? So we are going to be redesigning schools later today. Let's look at another civic institution, the grocery store. So like, for example, Annika, what is one thing you find most frustrating about the grocery store. I find it difficult how a lot of the times when I'm looking for essentials, I have to look around the entire store. Right, so we would throw that up here on the slide and you would then uh, think of as many of these frustrations as possible. Then try to take all the problems you found on the last slide and put them into big categories. For example, we could have problems with layout, problems with essentials, problems and try to put them into these categories. Now, if you have time left, and most of us won't, um, think of one of the categories and start to brainstorm different solutions that you could, um, you could use to um, solve this problem in the grocery store. And just, again, think of as many as possible. Finally, if you're still, you're really rushing ahead, you can start iterating different um, changes to this solution. But either way, we want you to work through this module. So uh, someone is going to paste the link to this slideshow in the chat again. It was there on the slides this morning. Um, but make a copy of this Google slideshow and use it for your own group. But remember, the main point of the next half hour is to really get to know your group. We'll be coming back together at around 11.05 AM. So let's um, just make sure that uh, we 
you spend all the time in the group you need and you can come back to the stage at 11.05 and we have more exciting events for you. So please head over to your room in the sessions tab on the far left and let us know if you have any questions in the chat or at the help desk. Make a copy of the slides. If you click the link I posted in the chat and go to file, make a copy. You'll need to be signed into a Google account though. Uh, feel free to use the slides as a starting off point um, for your discussion.